All right, and, and here we go. So if you're, you just wanna welcome you all, this is the second in a series of community meetings that are part of, of our local air quality monitoring project happening in partnership with the City of Hamilton and University of Toronto and funded by Health Canada. Tonight's session is called Air Quality in Hamilton, Understanding the Regulatory Framework. Uh, and I just wanna introduce myself. My name is Linda Lukasik, and I'm the Executive Director at Environment Hamilton. And we're facilitating the community engagement uh, portion of the project. Um, uh, for those who don't know us, we're a local not-for-profit environmental organization, and we have a mandate to provide Hamiltonians with knowledge and skills to be able to enhance and protect the environment uh, around us. Um, I'm going to introduce the others on the project team uh, momentarily, uh, but first, just some basic information about using Zoom meetings. Uh, first, we ask that, again, that you remain muted during the presentation portion of the session. And note too that closed captioning is available um, and you should be able to access it from the toolbar. Um, you can click on that CC button that you see at the menu on the menu at the bottom. And I also want to let you all know, uh, as you know already that re we're recording tonight's session and we're doing that so that we can share the presentation online for anyone else who isn't able to be here tonight. So there will be a question and answer period after our, our main presenters present. And during that period, um, you can provide input in several ways. You can use the chat feature and you'll see again on that menu, the little chat bubble, you can type your question in there and we'll be monitoring that. Or you can raise your virtual hand and then we'll invite you to unmute and ask your question. So I just wanna quickly run through the agenda tonight. So I've just finished with the welcome. We'll, we will do a land acknowledgement and then shift into our speakers. And as I say, there'll be questions after that. Um, and then a project update from Dr. Adams from University of Toronto. And then we'll be sharing some, some next steps. And I just wanna to say too, we will follow up um, to everyone who's registered for the webinar with an email. And that'll provide you with a link to the project page on our website. And on that page, there is a, a bit of a, a a sign up sheet that you can you can fill out so that you you're notified about any other future uh, community meetings related to the project and any project updates. Um, and then as well, there's just other information there about the project, including a link to a recording of the first meeting which gives a more in depth overview of, of what the project is all about. So I do want to start today with a, a land acknowledgement, I want to acknowledge that the land that uh, we're situated on here in Hamilton is the tra traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. Um, and the larger territory of Southern Ontario is the subject of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. And this is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe and the Mississaugas that bound them to peacefully share the territory and to protect the land. Uh, the single spoon reflects the need to share and to ensure that the bowl is never empty to take care of the land and the creatures we share it with. And there are no knives it, that indicates the need to protect and to share in peace. And subsequent indigenous nations and other peoples were invited into the covenant in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. And I just wanna say I'm grateful for the opportunity to gather on this territory, even virtually as we still have to do and to work in this community. Through this land acknowledgement, the intent is to honor and show gratitude to the original stewards of the land as a sign of respect and willingness to learn and to heal. Together, may we care for this land and each other, being mindful of generations to come. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce you at the start to the other members of the project team. Um, and you'll hear at, at least from one of them tonight. Um, and as I already said, this meeting is the second community meeting in a series of four meetings being held as part of this initiative funded by Health Canada. The city of Hamilton is the lead uh, partner on this project. Um, and the project is happening in collaboration with Environment Hamilton and the University of Toronto Department of Geography, Geomatics and Environment. And the project team includes from the city of Hamilton, Trevor Imhoff, who is a senior project manager, air quality and climate change. Andrea McDowell, who also works with Trev Trevor, she's a project manager in air quality and climate change. 
Um, Dr. Matthew Adams is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography, Geomatics and Environment at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. And Dr. Adams has two graduate students working on this effort. Uh, master's student Elicia Fuller Thompson and PhD student Jenny Suluang Kui. So tonight's meeting is focused on providing an overview of how air quality is regulated in Hamilton. And I just want to say from a community perspective, knowledge is power. And so for all of us as community members, there's power in having a good understanding of how our local air quality and any impacts on that air quality are regulated by government. So I'm really pleased that joining us here tonight, we have representatives from Health Canada, the Provincial Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, um, and City of Hamilton Public Health. And they're going to share with us details about the role that each level of government plays in local air quality issues. And we're starting tonight with the Provincial Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, um, as it is the province that really plays the main role in local air quality regulation. So I'm really pleased to welcome Stephanie Gaskell. And Stephanie uh, is an air compliance engineer with the ministry, and she's based here in Hamilton. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie, and I do just have to quickly um, swap out um, for Stephanie's slide deck. So bear with me for a moment here. Now that sometimes I have a lineup at the window, and then people are inside shopping, and they're asking me for signs, and, and, and I can't do both. Could, could I yeah. just ask that everybody so mute themselves? Need that please? extra person one, once in a while, you know. Yeah. So, Amber, anyway, I think that's you. Out. Help train Who people. needs to it mute? Sounds like I'm going to go back to a similar schedule than what I used to have. So more like four days a week instead of three. Not sure yeah. if you're able to mute her yourself, Linda. And it, it did is, work yeah. out to a little more hours before. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me just. Uh, work into three wasn't quite because I always did like about a. There we go. Okay. Yeah, Should I get started? That, everyone. Oops. Sorry, Stephanie, I think no, I just muted you. You too. did, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, no okay. Um, do you want me to get started then? Okay. okay, so thanks so much, Linda, and thank you for asking me to present at this meeting this evening. Um, I'm happy to be here on behalf of the ministry, as well as our Hamilton offices to present on the province's regulatory framework for local air quality. So as Linda mentioned, I'm an environmental engineer with specialty in air compliance, and I've been working with the Ministry of Environment for over 20 years, and 17 of those years have been out of the Hamilton office, and my focus has always been on air quality and working to find solutions for air compliance issues. And I guess just on a personal level, um, both as a professional engineer and also as someone who lives and works in Hamilton, um, I'm also passionate about the work the ministry does related to air quality. So just going on to the second slide. So this evening, I'm going to provide an overview of how the province regulates air quality at the community level. So very briefly, I'll speak to the structure of the law in Ontario for regulating air quality, and we'll outline the objectives of the local air quality regulation. I'm also going to speak to how industries demonstrate compliance with local air quality requirements. And you'll hear me um, explain some key concepts such as air standards, compliance options, and emission summary and dispersion modeling reports. I'll also speak to the work the ministry does to ensure facilities are complying with air regulatory requirements. And lastly, I'm going to highlight some resources and links that are available to the public to find out more information and how also how you can become involved as a member of the community in decisions that are made around air quality in Hamilton. So just on to slide three. So I'm gonna start out um, by very generally explaining the hierarchy of law in the province that is related to air quality. So the Environmental Protection Act or EPA is the overarching statute or act that was passed by legislature to allow for the reg for regulation of air quality. So the EPA sets out the ground rules for protecting the environment in Ontario, and it is the foundation for regulating air quality in the province. So it includes important definitions such as natural environment, which means the air, land, and water in Ontario. It defines air, which is defined as open air, so anything not enclosed inside a building, 
structure, machine, chimney, stack, or flue. And it also defines contaminant, which means any solid, liquid, gas, odor, heat, sound, vibration, radiation, or any combination of those that result either directly or indirectly from human activities that cause or may cause an adverse effect. So the EPA also defines what is meant by adverse effect, which is a key concept when it comes to regulating air quality. So very broadly, adverse effect may be caused by anything that is discharged into the natural environment that could possibly harm, injure, impair, or interfere with human health, plants, animals, business activities, or human safety. So under the EPA, a person is not allowed to discharge a contaminant into the natural environment that causes an adverse effect. Um, and you'll hear me refer to these definitions in the coming slides. Another key aspect of the EPA as it relates to air quality is that it outlines the need to obtain environmental approvals or permissions to operate in Ontario. So approvals and permissions include environmental certificates of approval, or some of you may have heard those referred to as ECAs or C of A's. Um, and it also includes environmental activity sector registries or EASER permissions. So the permissions world is meant to be risk-based with the highest risk sectors or activities requiring a ministry approval, lower risk sectors or activities requiring registration, and the lowest risk activities not requiring a permission at all, or um, that implies that they're exempt. So there's 25 regulations that have been made under the authority or umbrella of the Environmental Protection Act. And these regulations are the rules that are meant to set out the details and practical applications of the law. So just on to slide four. So under the umbrella of the Environmental Protection Act, Ontario's air-related regulations can be broken down into three categories. The first category is global air quality, and the intent of this category of regulations is to minimize impacts at a global level. Um, and it includes things such as managing greenhouse gas emissions and prohibiting the use of substances that can deplete the ozone layer. The second category of air regulations is regional air quality. And this group of regulations aims to minimize air emissions that may have impact at a provincial level or across regional borders, such as our borders with our neighbors to the south or other provinces. So these types of regulations have been instrumental in recent years in minimizing things like acid rain, um, and as well as decreasing the number of smog days that we've experienced in the province. So the third category of regula uh, regulations, which is the focus today, is local air quality. And local air quality regulations are meant to manage air emissions near a source and in a local community. community. So the key regulation in this category that I'm going to be speaking to in more detail in the coming slides is Ontario Regulation 419, or Reg 419, which is commonly called. Um, and formally, it is called Air Pollution Local Air Quality. So Reg 419 came into effect in 2005, so 17 years ago now, um, and it replaced the ministry's previous local air quality regulations. So just on to slide five, Linda. So while the local air quality regulation itself is very technical, the overall key objectives of the regulation are meant to be straightforward. So the objectives of the regulation are to protect local communities from the effects of air pollution that may result from nearby industrial or commercial operations, and to set out the requirements for facilities that discharge chemicals and particles into the air from their operations. Um, just very broadly, so overall, the local air quality regulation is based on the concept of risk of exposure. So this risk is managed through an air standards setting process, as well as by targeting or identifying operations that emit contaminants that have the potential to be of concern from a human health or environmental perspective. 
So just on to slide six. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a key concept under the regulation, which is an error standard. So an error standard is a number. Specifically, it's a number that's directly written into the regulation that represents the maximum amount of chemicals or particles that a facility is allowed to have outside of their property boundary. So new or updated air standards in the local air quality regulation are based solely on science and they are set at a level that is intended to prevent an adverse effect from occurring. So when an air standard is set, there's no consideration given as to whether there are economic or technical challenges that may exist that make it difficult or even not possible for a facility to meet that number. Um, and these numbers also don't give consideration to the location where possible impact is happening. So what that means is that the same air standard applies to a location where there are no people um, as it does in a location where there actually are people, so such as a residential neighborhood. So just on to the next slide, slide seven. So since regulation 419 came into place, approximately 69 new or updated air standards have been introduced. And these numbers are determined by scientists called toxicologists who work for the ministry. So because air standards are phased in, and because there are different ways that a facility can show compliance with the regulation, which I'll speak to on the next slide, um, the regulation also includes numbers that are called upper risk thresholds or URTs. So upper risk thresholds do correspond to an air standard, but they are set at a higher value. And in between that air standard level and upper risk threshold level is a region that the ministry refers to as the as low as reasonably achievable or a LARA region. So just on to slide eight. Okay, so keeping in mind um, the different levels I spoke to on the previous slide. So specifically the air standard level, the as low as reasonably achievable or a LARA region and the upper risk threshold level. I'll briefly explain now the three ways under the local air quality regulation that a facility can show that they comply with the province's local air quality requirements. So most facilities in the province are able to demonstrate that the concentration of contaminants emitted outside of their property meet air limits using an air dispersion model or a combination of models and air monitoring. So these facilities fall under the first category shown, shown here. So there are, however, some situations where facilities and sectors have one or more contaminants emitted from their operations that cannot meet the regulated air standard. And for these situations, there are two more options available and allowable under the regulation for them to be able to demonstrate compliance. So one of these options is requesting and meeting a site-specific, sorry, site-specific standard, which is the second option shown here. So a site-specific air standard really is what it sounds like. It's an air standard that is set based on a facility's site-specific conditions. So toxicologists within our ministry work together with our engineering and compliance staff to set a site-specific standard for a limited period of time that is within that ALERA zone and that is still protective of adverse effects within the community. The site-specific standard setting process is a rigorous process that requires a facility to consult with the public and also requires facilities to have a specific action plan to lower their emissions from their facility in a timely manner. And this process also allows for the facility to request consideration of economic factors. So the ministry can only approve a site-specific air standard if certain conditions are met. The last option to demonstrate compliance under the local air quality regulation is to register and meet the requirements of a technical standard. So technical standards are developed when multiple facilities cannot meet one or more air standards for similar reasons. Um, they're different than the first two options in that in a technical standard, there's no calculated number 
or air standard that a facility must meet. Instead, there's um, specific requirements related to the types of equipment they must have in place to control their emissions from their facility, as well as rules around how the facility is allowed to operate. So just for interest, in Hamilton, there are five facilities who have approved site-specific standards, and there's only one facility in Hamilton that is registered to a technical standard. Um, and I've included details on those facilities um, in the appendices to this presentation. So slide nine. So one of the key aspects of the local air quality regulation is the requirement for facilities to prepare and update a document that is called an emission summary and dispersion modeling report or ESDM report for short, um, in short. So these reports are the key document that a facility uses to demonstrate their ability to comply with the air standards that are included in the regulation. So Reg 419 is very specific in outlining what has to be included in these reports and what are considered acceptable ways for a facility to calculate, calculate or measure their emissions. An ESDM report also includes information on how a facility inputs their calculations or measurements into a computer model to determine what impact those emissions have outside of their property boundary. An ESDM report includes an itemized list of every source of air emissions on site, including every stack, as well as a list of every chemical or particle that is emitted from each stack or source. The report also tells you how close the emissions are to reaching the air standards that are outlined in the regulation. So I also wanted to mention that the regulation requires that a facility has to share a copy of the executive summary of their ESGM report if a member of the public asks them for it. Okay, and then on to slide 10. So um, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks has a whole division that is dedicated to verifying and enforcing compliance with the province's environmental laws. Also under our Environmental Assessment and Permissions Division, we also have a permissions branch that is responsible for assessing the information that's provided with the request for approval. So some of you may be familiar with, with this, but included in our compliance division are environmental officers or provincial officers who have authority to enforce regulations under the Environmental Protection Act. Environmental officers conduct inspections at facilities to ensure that the facilities are operating in accordance with any site-specific requirements of their approvals or permissions documents. And our environmental officers also respond to complaints received from the public. If an officer happens to identify an issue with compliance, either through their root routine work or as the result of complaints, um, these officers are able to require individuals or facilities to take corrective actions. And there's some situations, so investigators may also become involved in situations where there's a consideration to take action before the courts. So also within our division are a team of technical staff that include engineers, scientists, and technicians. And technical staff may work to support our environmental officers both in the field. Um, so just for interest, this picture here on the right is actually a photo taken of me assisting an environmental officer with an air inspection. Um, and we also assist by reviewing technical documents. So air engineers, so that's my role. Um, our job is to review the way facilities calculate their emissions. And we also ensure that the computer modeling that is done for a facility has been done correctly. And where there are problems, we also work with our officers to identify how those issues could be resolved. Scientists and technicians within our technical team also review um, as regularly as on a daily basis, the, um, the data that is received from the air monitoring stations in Hamilton. And I'm gonna speak more to this work um, this team does on the next slide. So slide 11. Um, so air quality monitoring 
in Hamilton has taken place for a number of years now. Um, and I believe it actually started in the early 1970s. And industry took over the bulk of air monitoring in Hamilton under what is called the Source Emissions Monitoring or SEM program, which was a program that was intended to put the onus of monitoring both logistically and financially over to industry. The ministry does still, however, have a key role in the ambient air monitoring program for Hamilton. So our regional office in Hamilton has a team of air monitoring technicians that conduct around 180 performance and site audits of the monitoring network in Hamilton alone every year. Um, and I should mention that this work was deemed essential by our government and even continued throughout the COVID pandemic period. So these audits and this work allow us to have a very high level of confidence in the quality of data that is measured and reported at the air monitoring stations in Hamilton. So the ministry receives data from the Hamilton monitoring network and our technical staff review and analyze this data in a number of ways. So this includes looking at the data to identify any possible areas, areas of non-compliance with the regulated air standards, as well as to identify any issues that require follow-up by our environmental officers. The data from these air monitors is also used to track progress, as well as to inform decisions related to new regulations and standards. So just for interest here, for those of you that are familiar with Beasley Park in Hamilton, uh, so this photo here is of the station that is situated in that park. And the data from the station here is where the information is gathered from to report on the air quality health index levels or AQHI levels for Hamilton. And I'll provide some more information on the coming slides and how you can access that information for Hamilton. Whoops. So on slide 12, so I wanted to share a map of the air quality monitoring network that exists in Hamilton. And I apologize because I know that some of the font here is small, um, but hopefully if there's a handout provided um, following this evening, you'll be able to uh, see it a little bit more clearly. So Hamilton's air quality network is quite expansive. And my understanding is that on a per capita basis, the network in Hamilton is one of the most expansive in the province um, and possibly even within Canada. We even have other jurisdictions that reach out to us for support and assistance when assessing their own air monitoring needs. So just a bit of an overview uh, for this map. So the gray labels on this map indicate a monitoring station that is run by industry. The two yellow ones are ministry stations and the three purple ones are Environment Canada stations that our ministry operates and maintains on their behalf. And the two teal green dots shown on the map indicate two City of Hamilton monitoring locations. And my understanding is that those might actually be changing um, very soon. Um, so I'll also point out that some contaminants are measured continuously and some are measured on fixed days. And whether something is measured continuously or non-continuously ultimately comes down to the technology that is available to do measurements of individual contaminants. And also, I just want to point out that um, some of the stations on this map are set up to solely measure meteorological conditions, such as wind, temperature, and precipitation, um, which also factor into local air quality. And just on slide, uh, 13. Okay, so just as I wrap up the presentation, I just wanted to make you aware of where you can find other information on air quality, as well as areas where you as a member of the public are able to have your say. So this slide here outlines some ministry specific resources. So to learn more about information on air quality in Ontario, and how Hamilton compares to other locations in the province, you can access annual reports on air quality. You can also sign up through the Environmental Registry of Ontario to receive notifications related to new or updated policies, requests for certificates of approval, et cetera. And it's through that mechanism that you can formally provide your comments, concerns, or even support for any of those postings. 
Access Environment is a tool that allows you to search an area to see what approvals, permissions, or registrations have been granted. And Air Quality Health Index Ontario provides information on current air quality levels and also has a sign-up tool where you can request to see auto automated alerts on air quality levels. And by contacting our Hamilton District Office, you also have the opportunity to speak directly to an environmental officer with any concerns or questions that you may have. And just on to slide 14. So I also wanted to highlight that there's several, several resources outside of the ministry that also provide information on air quality in Hamilton. The Hamilton Air Monitoring Network or HAMN website provides further information on the air monitoring that is done in Hamilton. And you can even access real-time information here for some contaminants. And each year, Clean Air Hamilton, of which Linda is also a member, um, publishes a report on the state of air in Hamilton. And these reports are also available publicly on their website at the link shown here. And to get facility specific information, you can also search on the federal NPRI or National Pollutant Release Inventory, or you can even directly contact a facility and request that they provide you with a copy of the executive summary of their emission summary and dispersion modeling report. And then that takes me to the last slide, um, Linda. So I, I think the plan, as you said, was to wait until the Q&A period to ask questions. Um, so I'll hand it back over to you now. Thanks. Great. Th thank you so much, Stephanie, and really appreciate you walking through uh, what, what can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. So I appreciate you providing that solid um, overview of, of the regulation. I'm now just going to jump us over to the other slide deck. Um, and uh, we'll queue up our next presenter. So let me just move us along. All right, so I am really pleased now um, to welcome Patrick Hemmel. Uh, Patrick is a senior scientific evaluator in the air quality assessment section with, health, with the Healthy Environments and Consumer Safety Branch at Health Canada. Uh, over to you, Patrick. Hi everybody, so um, I'll be speaking to how um, the Kenyan Ambient Air Quality Standards are set by the federal government. So I work with the Water and Air Quality Bureau of Health Canada and unfortunately my uh, colleague Shara Hong is sick tonight so uh, uh, she won't be presenting with us. But don't worry, I'll cover the whole thing. Next slide please. So I'll start by giving you an overview of the air quality management system uh, or the AQMS in Canada. So the management of air quality is a shared responsibility in Canada among the federal, provincial and territorial governments. So the figure on the left shows that the system is based on collaboration. So all levels of government work together to implement the AQMS under the CCME. So the CCME is the Council of Ministry, uh, Minister of the Environment. And they all work towards the goal of continuous improvement in air quality to protect uh, human health and the environment. So the CAKES or the Canadian Air Quality Standards is the main driver of the system. So there are various mechanisms in place to help meeting the CAKES. And I'll invite you to visit the online website of the CCME to learn more about these. So although Quebec supports the general objective of the AQMS, it will not implement a system since it includes federal industrial emission requirements that duplicate Quebec's regulation. However, Quebec is collaborating on developing other elements of the system, such as the air zones. Next slide, please. So there are four cakes in Canada. So the fine particulate matter or PM 2.5, the ground level ozone, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide. So these are all the air quality objectives under CEPA published in 1999. And with the setting of these cakes, uh, always considered multiple factors such as health effects, environmental effects, 
uh, the feasibility and achievability of these uh, levels. So the AQMS uh, was built on a foundation of collaboration, uh, accountability, and transparency. So the industry, uh, non-governmental, and indigenous organizations work with governments to develop the AQMS. And they continue to monitor uh, the implementation of AQMS and to participate in its uh, ongoing development and improvement. Next slide, please. So the federal government, uh, how it's involved uh, in the development of the CAKES, uh, there are two departments involved, so Health Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada. So they both support the review of the CAKES for continuous improvement of air quality in Canada. And they conduct periodic review of the scientific literature, so generally every five years, to look at the most recent health and environmental effects what are the current and projected pollutant uh, levels and what are the main sources and what are the emission trends. The next slide, please. So in terms of Health Canada specifically, uh, there, uh, there are two main uh, roles. So the first one is to calculate the health impact or the health burden of uh, air pollution. So as a whole, looking at the PM 2.5, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and ozone uh, per year. It's uh, calculated that it causes over 15,000 premature deaths, 2.7 million asthma symptom days, and uh, 35 million acute respiratory symptom days. And that's uh, all available uh, to the public. And there's a report published last year uh, in 2021. The second role is to uh, review and document the health effects. So look at the, the new literature. So the first point of that is to look at um, what, uh, what, what exactly uh, air pollution causes in terms of health, health effects. So we conclude on um, different, um, uh, different health outcomes, such as heart, lung, cancer outcomes, and hospital visits, premature deaths. A second point, it also looks at what are the emerging health effects. So uh, there, there's, for example, growing evidence that air pollution increases the risk of neurological, uh, like um, Alzheimer's or autism, metabolic uh, effects such as uh, diabetes and reproductive and developmental outcomes such as lo low birth weight. The third point is that uh, uh, we look at them um, uh, the, let's say the shape of the relationship between the exposure to air pollution and the health outcomes. And the most recent scientific, uh, scientific evidence continue to uh, show that there is no safe level of exposure for three of the, uh, the four cakes, so fine PM, NO2, and ozone. And the last point is we look at the, what are the susceptible or, the, or vulnerable populations in Canada. So we, we've been documenting that there's an increased risk of adverse effects for uh, uh, children or pre -existing, uh, those with pre-existing health conditions. Next slide, please. So the CAKES are adopted by the CCME, and th that is based on the recommendation of the CAKES Development and Review Working Group. So this is acronym CEDAR, the CAKES Development and Review Working Group. So this, this uh, CAKES review approach is, uh, could be divided in, in five major steps. So the first step is the writing of the assessment report, looking at the scientific literature on health and environmental effects, and the projected pollutant levels, uh, just like I described you, this is uh, done by Environment Canada and Health Canada. Uh, the second point is the CCME agrees on a range of concentration as the basis for the future cakes. The third point, the CEDAR working group uh, selects a value for the future cakes from within the range. That's always considering uh, the different factors as I mentioned before, like health, environmental effects, existing standards, current concentration, and achievability. Fourth point, uh, fourth step would be the CCME considers the adoption of the CEDAR recommended case. And the last step uh, is, the, uh, is the establishment of the case 
as an ambient air quality objective under SIPA by the federal government. Next slide, please. So here I'm showing a, a table of the current and proposed case. So currently there are four cakes, as I mentioned before. So ozone, fine PM, SO2, and NO2. So most of them have a short and a longer term um, averaging time. And as I said, they're reviewed periodically. So uh, it started in 2015, then there was reviewed in uh, 2020 and in 2025. So as we can see, every, uh, every review brings a lower number and this is in line with the continuous improvement um, uh, objective of the AQMS. And the fine PM, the order PM 2.5, as you can see, uh, it's uh, currently on the review uh, and it's gonna be uh, effective in 2025. Next slide, please. It's important to know that the cakes are not pollute uh, up two levels. The cakes are, are actually um, underpinned by a, a four color code uh, system. And this means that the higher the concentration of the air pollutant, the more rigorous the actions to be implemented in, in uh, local air zones um, are required. So the, the local air zones are um, the geographic areas used to manage local air quality by the province or the territory. The, ter the province and territories are uh, also responsible for reporting on CAKES achievements and on the applicable management action. And the federal government provides guidance and assistance to province and territories uh, through the, through the uh, different uh, documents. Next slide. So here I just provide some resources if you want to know more. Um, and if you have questions, uh, if you think after the presentation, you can always email us to the uh, email above. You can just note too that in the Human Health Science Assessment of Case Pollutants, the PM 2.5, we just published two weeks ago. So it's fresh and new and uh, available to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. And just for anyone who's on the call, we'll make sure that we share a link to the slide decks for you so that if you want to, um, follow up with any of these links, you'll be able to do that. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased now to welcome our, our final uh, speaker, uh, as far as you know, speaking to the air regulatory framework, and that is Matthew Lawson. And Matthew is the manager of environmental health, health hazards, and vector-borne disease uh, within the city of Hamilton's public health unit. Uh, so over to you, Matthew, and I'll get you started with your first slide. Thank you very much, Linda. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Linda mentioned, I am a, a manager for public health services here in the city of Hamilton. And um, uh, you may have heard where there is a pandemic going on and I will have been redeployed for a lot of this pandemic to help with that effort, given the amount of resources needed locally. Um, other colleagues, including Trevor Imhoff and uh, Shelly uh, Rogers, who are on our air quality and climate change team, were also uh, redeployed for periods of this pandemic. But um, this very important work of climate change and air quality has been tethered through the uh, the work of Andrea McDowell, who is also here in the uh, meeting with us this evening. So I just want to acknowledge the team in Hamilton for continuing to keep an eye on um, many of these important issues in Hamilton as we uh, struggle to deal locally with this pandemic. So onward, um, if you don't mind, Linda, if you can just advance the slide. So we've heard, uh, you know, highlighted earlier in the presentation, the province of Ontario um, has the legal authority and enforcement responsibilities for regulating air quality in Hamilton and across Ontario. So, you know, what what is it with public health services that speaks to this realm? So in Ontario, there is a document called the Ontario Public Health Standards. And one of the program standards within the Ontario Public Health Standards is the Healthy Environments Program Standard. And the goal of the Healthy Environments Program Standard is to reduce exposure to health hazards and promote the development of healthy built and natural environments 
that support and mitigate existing and emerging risks, um, including the impacts of climate change. So it's a broad mandate. So what are some examples of topic areas within that broad mandate? Well, as I mentioned, built in natural environments and climate change, as well as exposure to hazardous environmental contaminants and biological agents, exposure to radiation, uh, including UV light and radon, um, extreme weather. So, you know, thinking heat alerts, cold alerts, impacts from climate change that are, are expected to get more extreme as we go forward in time. Indoor and outdoor air pollutants would comprise part of this. Uh, radon being an indoor health hazard, uh, outdoor air pollutants uh, could be anything from um, a, a one-off incident event or something that's recognized trend-wise that is impacting health at, an, at a level that is uh, able to be identified through our surveillance means. And other emerging environmental exposures. So guidelines and protocols, I'll quickly just address what's below the Healthy Environments Program standard. There are documents um, like guidelines and protocols that are referenced within the Healthy Environments Program standard. And they include the Healthy Environment and Climate Change Guidelines the Health Hazard Response Protocol, and the Rabies Prevention and Control Protocol. Next slide, please, Linda. Uh, this slide illustrates some of the core public health work. So this is in the standards, they refer to this type of work as foundational work. So it, it is work that is carried across all program standards. So within the Healthy Environments Program standard, uh, there is a desire to um, focus on health promotion and education with, uh, and that is a means through coordinating stakeholders and engaging them on uh, topics of interest and need, educating uh, and public health campaigns, um, and trying to trying to get ahead of an outcome. So public health upstream interventions, that's at the core of public health work on why we do health promotion and education. Also part of our foundational work <clears throat> as per the standards is performing surveillance and uh, using data and interpreting and analyzing data to identify trends uh, in health outcomes as well as perhaps the environmental precursor that might um, cause those outcomes, uh, as well as equity and social determinants of health are also part of the core uh, foundational work within the Ontario Public Health Standards. Next slide, please. So this slide provides just some, some illustrations or pictures of uh, things that some in the public may have seen that are, um, that are examples of work that are mandated within the standards that I've been speaking about. So in the left-hand side, uh, there is, you can see a copy of the 2019 Air Quality Progress Report that came from Cleaner Hamilton. And uh, right below it is an example of a, of a graph of air emission or of a, a particular pollutant that would be in, uh, that referred to in that report to talk about what's the status of pollution in Hamilton. Also in the slide shows a picture People may have seen this in the community over the past couple of years, um, pre-pandemic, uh, which is the mission radon. Um, we did do a local radon prevalence study in Hamilton in 1990 or er, in 2019. We initiated it, and um, interesting little finding we had. Like uh, Health Canada, the best information that we did have before performing this local survey was. Uh, in 2010, Health Canada did a nationwide radon uh, prevalence study and survey, and their findings found that there was an estimated 5% of homes in Hamilton likely had a radon level that was above a level that was of concern. Um, and we thought, you know, there was some anecdotal information that started to lead us into looking further at the literature. And we thought we should be doing a little bit more uh, on this and what's in our budget to offer free radon monitors to participants if they wanted to join our study. And we were able to get a, a, a decent uh, sample size. And, and we did find that, you know, there's it, the level was about 15% uh, prevalence rate of having radon in homes, three times the previous estimate that we had. So um, it was an interesting finding that was local data obtained for it. I love projects like that, although it's not the primary function of public health, but it's it's certainly whenever we can 
try and get a project going like the one that we're here discussing tonight um, with Health Canada, our partners there. Um, we love to do that and uh, look further into if there is any concern that we see from environmental and health outcome relationships. And the other things that you see on this slide, it's <clears throat> not specific to air quality, but it's still within the the broad program of health hazards and vector-borne diseases is some promotional items related to rabies. So rabies is an endemic disease uh, within our wildlife population in this area. And um, we do have a couple of different strains of rabies. So it is a, still a real health hazard, but um, I thought that these were very interesting ad campaign because it uh, created fake animals that made people do a double take and think, what the heck are they talking about with this? Next slide, please. So more examples, this slide provides more examples of um, some of the work that goes on specifically related to the air quality programming. So, um, you know, we do in our program, we work with the community, including non-government organizations, academia, uh, the provincial and federal levels of government to help improve air quality through various uh, um, processes. So one of them being, as I was saying, just to, to relay a little bit more information, surveillance. So through the form of air model uh, monitoring activities, um, reference to this project uh, that we're speaking with uh, Health Canada and uh, Dr. Matthew Adams at U of T related to um, this, this proposed project. And, um, you know, if it weren't for um, local public health staff advocating to be a part of this and apply for federal grants, uh, it probably couldn't happen from our buy-in side. So that's where we come in and our team um, did apply for that funding. And so we're partnering up with Health Canada and uh, the, research, the research scientists. Um, public health services also, we manage two portable air quality monitoring stations that are part of the Hammond network um, that um, was referred to earlier in the uh, presentation by Stephanie. And so the Hamilton Air Monitoring Network, uh, two air pointer monitors that the city of Hamilton owns and operates, um, go on to, uh, you know, provide to the body of air quality monitoring in the city to allow us to further understand where uh, areas of concern may be regarding air pollution. They are mobile air monitoring stations, and so there is a methodology to where we locate them. We're trying to build uh, information in areas of the city that uh, that haven't previously been monitored before that could uh, be showing uh, some, some interesting readings. Um, and if you just go one, oh, no, we can stay here. Sorry, Linda. Um, I just wanted to mention, too, so a large part of the function of the air quality program, and it's been um, a mainstay, I think, since 2010, is the Clean Air Hamilton or 2009, and it was born out of a, a previous committee, but Clean Air Hamilton, public health services staff coordinate and facilitate uh, the functioning of Clean Air Hamilton. Uh, it's a multi-stakeholder group that's comprised of industry, businesses, government, academia, environmental not-for-profits, and citizens all with the same interest in mind to improve air quality and increase the knowledge and awareness and the importance of air quality. Um, part of our, um, our advocacy and our uh, budget, actually, we, we do reserve some of our budget to become available for uh, grants through Clean Air Hamilton. So um, in recent years, we've had approximately $30,000 available to organizations to compete um, to complete air quality monitoring, but there is a competition that has to be had since we are part of the city. We have a procurement office that keeps us uh, on, on our toes with uh, complying with procurement things. And uh, we're trying to work with our, our colleagues and partners within Clean Air Hamilton to improve that process a little more from the last year, but um, more on that another time at Clean Air Hamilton, perhaps. Anyway, we do provide those grant opportunities for groups um, to perform uh, activities and, um, and uh, 
and provide information in Hamilton. So uh, one of the examples of what Clean Air Hamilton does is one of the flagship programs that's been uh, around for years is the Fresh Air for Kids program, which is a collaboration between Green Venture and uh, Core Research. Um, people attending this meeting may be familiar with Dr. Dennis Core. Um, <clears throat> and so this partnership conducts mobile air monitoring around schools to help provide educational workshops to the children within the schools and teachers on sustainable and healthy routes to school. So Dennis is very happy to always talk about his experiences when he goes to teach a classroom and they start to make the connection between scientific monitoring of air quality and seeing visual spikes on a uh, an instrument that reads pollution. And so uh, they've done things in the past too to make it fun for them to take it like a, they were issuing tickets to cars that were idling uh, outside of the school because it's producing more air pollution than is necessary to. Next slide, please. Oh, I'd like to put in a plug here. This is for the Upwind Downwind Conference. So yet another example of um, activities within the program of air quality uh, for the city of Hamilton is a every two year conference we've been helping uh, facilitate and leading the uh, production of is the Upwind Downwind Conference. And this year uh, we hope to be back. Uh, the, the pandemic did uh, thwart the last uh, 2020 uh, Upwind Downwind Conference. This one hopes to be an in uh, an in-person conference this year. So, uh, and it's titled that the theme of the conference is building healthy post-carbon cities. So uh, putting a plug in there for the Upwind Downwind, Downwind Conference and uh, the scheduled date for the conference is Thursday, June 16th of this year. Um, I think that's it for now, just in the interest of time, perhaps, like I'm happy to be part of the group to answer any questions that come forward, though. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matthew. I think I'm going to stop sharing so that people can see each other. And we are we are going to pause a little bit now and, and give um, attendees an opportunity to ask any questions that you might want to ask any of our speakers. So just a reminder. Um, you can either put up your virtual hand and you'll see you should be able to access that um, under, I think it's under more or reactions in the menu that you should see at the bottom of your screen. Or um, you can also opt to um, type your question into the chat. So I'm actually going to just take a quick peek and see if we've got questions in the chat. And I will ask those to start. Okay, so we have a question here, and the the uh, question is: How can residents access reliable tests to determine their own indoor air quality? I've paid for a radon test. I do have concerns living in an old leaky house close to the railway at Bayfront. So I'm going to put that out there, and um, I imagine maybe Matt Lawson, you'll want to start, but I would invite any of our other speakers to chime in if you'd like to add anything. Thank you, Linda. Sure. Um, so this, if you've purchased a radon test, the, the problem with testing for air quality is that you have to want to understand what you're looking for. Um, so you're going to need likely specific equipment or sensor modules for the type of pollutant that you're in search of. With respect to radon, um, if you've purchased a radon test, um, hopefully it's a test that has some reliability to it. I can say that if you were to go to our website uh, in the city, so it'd be hamilton.ca slash radon. If you go to that website, you can, um, thank you very much, Trevor, for throwing that in there right away, a link to it in the chat. Uh, in there, there is a link to uh, um, you know, trusted sources of where to uh, obtain radon monitors. Um, I will also say, but the anecdote in your, the way you framed the question, that if you have concerns living in an old leaky house, um, it everybody the, the thing about radon is is that you can't rely on what's next 
next door. You 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 can't if your if your neighbor has a high rating of radon, it's not a given that you're going to have a high rating. Um, and to really understand what your risk is, you should be measuring your old house. If you have a leaky house, radon can easily enter it. But I will say that it also can easily get mixed into the air and be diluted so that the concentrations are often older. Um, just relaying very briefly, uh, the city of uh, the, the Windsor Essex Health Unit did a radon prevalence study, a three year study um, in uh, the late 2000 teens. And they found that the, the newer built homes actually had higher concentrations of radon because they were so weather tight. So the more sealed the home is built and it's higher R value, it actually led to higher concentrations of radon. Whereas those older century homes, even though radon can get in, it can also get out and mix around. Thank you for that answer, Matthew. Um, okay, I just, I, I see a comment in the chat. Two air monitoring stations are so, so few. We need so many more. Um, is a comment that I see. Um, and here's a question from Kathy. Kathy wants to know what enforcement is available for idling train engines in the CN yard in the north end? And boy, Kathy, I know exactly what you're talking about with that issue. So I wonder if anyone, if any of our guests, guest speakers want to respond to that, the issue of um, train locomotives and emissions from those locomotives. Yeah, you know what, Linda, I might uh, take take a kick at it here to start with. It is, you know, an odd situation and one that we, we hear a lot about from the residents, uh, a concerning one. Um, obviously, trains, you know, there are certain times when they're required to idle for operational purposes, keeping, you know, pressure in their lines, shunting the trains, uh, sometimes in freezing temperatures. Unfortunately, the CN uh, rail yards fall outside of the provincial jurisdiction, actually falls within the federal jurisdiction. And there are some regulations within the can within the railway safety act that say when you can and can't idle and how long you should be idling for so um really the from the provincial standpoint i can't stop the flow of trains so our officers can't stop the flow of goods on on uh, federal uh, undertakings but uh, you can uh there, there's transport canada and environment canada that you can file some concerns with. Uh, we do try our best to, you know, stay in contact with CN where we can uh, because we do get some complaints around the shunting aspects, and we try to, uh, you know, educate them where we can on the importance of, you know, if you're shunting them, trying to do it at the right time. No one wants to hear a train being shunted at 3 a.m. Uh, I can I can imagine that can cause lots of uh, uh, lots of heartburn for folks out there. And when it comes to idling, you know, your hope they're being uh, cognizant, and we do have some CN contacts. Uh, that we've reached out to in the past to, to encourage you know best practices. Thanks for that, Stephen. And for people on the call who may not know um, Stephen, Stephen Burt is the district manager um, at the Hamilton District Office of the Ministry of Environment. So thank you for that. And, and I would just add too, um, I am aware of other communities where it's either CP or CN, one of the big rail ways is testing um, low to no emission um, diesel or, or locomotives, the big locomotives that they use in the shunting yards. So, so I, I would add too, you know, might be worth us starting to write letters to those big <laughs> railway lines and urge them to bring cleaner technology into Hamilton, especially in locations so close to residential areas, because it, it can be pretty bad down there for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, thanks. My apologies for not introducing myself. Well, that's okay. Yeah, thanks for that. I just want to make sure that. people know who you are. Thanks. Okay, and, and there is a comment right underneath Kathy's comment from Keegan that says, I'm also curious about the trains. We live near the CP rail line and see a lot of fun colors come out of the engines. Do the air standards apply to the railway corridor in the same way as for the industrial facilities? So Keegan, you'll have just heard that. No, they, they don't actually. So, um, uh, you know, maybe what we'll do, uh, I'll share in, in the email follow-up, at least some of the information that we're aware of at Environment Hamilton um, to help folks to get a better handle on that railway locomotive issue if you're interested. Okay, and I do see, let's, let's go to Dax. Dax, I see your virtual hand up. So why don't you unmute and feel free to ask your question. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, Linda, and also to all of the organizers and the speakers. This is a really vital resource and I very much appreciate it. Um, also appreciative of the recording because I've been chasing around kids and I haven't been listening as um, actively as I had hoped. I have a question for Stephanie and specifically for the MECP. 
um, as well. So we have the science data analysis and evidence that informs the air standards. We have the special exemptions that um, emitters can apply for um, under site-specific standards. We have the upper risk thresholds. Um, there are cases in which there are emitters that go even above site-specific standards. Um, and there's a lot of evidence, data analysis, et cetera, that makes up the air standards themselves. But is there any data collection, analysis, et cetera, of site-specific standards themselves, cumulative health and environmental impacts of the special exemptions to province-wide air standards? And if those themselves are um, exceeded the site-specific standards, is there any data evidence analysis of the effects of exceeding even site-specific standards? Okay, I'll do my best because I think there was a lot of questions in that <laughs> one question. Um, I, I guess I'll just mention first. So under the regulation, whether a facility has a site-specific standard or an air standard, those are considered equal compli acceptable compliance approaches under the regulation. Um, so a site-specific standard is not technically an exemption, but it's um, legally what applies to that facility. Um, in terms of what happens if a facility was exceeding a site-specific standard, we would handle that um, in the same way that we would handle any um, exceedance of any air standard. So in that situation, if we become aware of a situation where a facility is out of compliance, um, with their site-specific standards, so either through an assessment that we come across through an ESDM report um, or some other modeling exercise or through information we have available at a monitoring station, um, then that would be referred to our compliance staff and um, there would be follow-up work there. Um, it would be treated the same way, so we'd be dealing potentially with orders or other tools um, to get the facility below those numbers. Um, I did want to mention as well, so I think you also had a question about exceeding a uh, upper risk threshold or URT. Is that right? Um, yes, indeed. Yes. Um, okay. I'm also, I guess I'm asking in the context of Sault Ste. Marie as well. Um, oh, okay. So steel industry, but in a, in a slightly different geographical context. Okay. Um, so I'll be honest, I'm not as familiar with the situation um, at Algoma and Sault Ste. Marie. Um, but I guess very generally, the response is that regardless of if, if, if a facility is exceeding the site specific standard that applies to them, it should be handled um, as non compliance as any as it would for any other facility exceeding an air standard. So um, if you have concerns about a specific situation, I would suggest reaching out to the local district office in Sault Ste. Marie, um, and maybe they can help you with that. I don't know, Steve, if you want to add anything um, from a compliance perspective? Yeah, no, I think if there's, you know, first and foremost, I think it's a great question. And, and you know, these this regulation can be uh, you know, complicated with the URTs and exceedances of, of normal air standards. In the event that a company is exceeding a site-specific standard, then we would approach that in an enforcement format. Um, that approach, uh, you know, we would use our different compliance frameworks we have available to us. Uh, it, depending what the incident is, we would we would require certain actions. It might be uh, an additional action plan. It could be, uh, you know, uh, new controls implemented uh, it could be right to charges as well uh, our group here in hamilton we have two groups uh so in, in the province we wear two hats at the enforcement level we have the abatement hat which is the group i manage and we have the enforcement uh group which is the investigators so you know goal of of our group here in the abatement world is, is compliance uh and so if we've identified non-compliance we refer that over to our uh, investigations branch who would proceed with the charges our job is to ensure that actions are being taken to get people into compliance. Um, and so there could be various approaches that would be uh, be taken towards uh, ensuring a company gets into compliance. If there is something like a URT exceedance, you know, there's underneath regulation 419, it sets out some requirements under section 30 when exceedance occurs, what has to happen? They have to do some fine tune assessments. They have to look at contours based on the model to say, is there a URT being exceeded at a sensitive receptor at a residential area or is that URT exceedance 
in the in the industrial area at their property line. So there are various steps that occur in those circumstances. But if there are some specific sites or specific areas that you're concerned with that, you can always call the Hamilton District Office. Uh, we can talk further about that uh, in the specifics. Uh, and if it's related to Ogoma or other facilities in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, the Sault Ste. Marie Office is similar set up as Hamilton and you can make a call to them uh, and speak directly about the facility if you want some specifics. Thank, thank you for that, Stephanie and uh, Stephen. Um, so we do have another comment from Mary around um, train related emissions this time, uh, you know, both CP Freight and GO trains on in a different part of the city. So I, I guess what I'll say is I'm definitely going to share details with all of you about the understanding that we have at Environment Hamilton about how this process works. And there's some documents we can share because there is the memorandum of understanding between Transport Canada and at least the two big uh, rail lines. So, so I think that will help. And, and I'd add that we'd be interested in getting some community conversations going about that issue too. Um, I see another comment here from Melinda. She says she lives in the east end of Hamilton and the air sometimes has a strong chemical smell. She's reported bad air quality before to the ministry and she's curious to know what happens after a complaint as ma is made. Are all complaints followed up on is her question. So Stephen, I think yeah, that may I can be take, for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure, I can take that. And thanks, Melinda, great question. And um, as you can imagine in Hamilton, you know, with the uh, land use compatibility challenges we see, uh, we do receive, uh, you know, quite a few uh, air quality uh, concerns and complaints filed with our, uh, with our office. Um, yes, I think our goal and aim is to respond and, and, and follow up on every complaint. Um, as you could imagine, resources become challenging. We have to prioritize and, and work through, uh, you know, work through our uh, complaints as they come in. Um, when it comes to a chemical type smell, that would be something that would absolutely flag us to to get out and, uh, you know, assess the area, look around, figure out what's happening. It's important when residents are experiencing odors, uh, are experiencing what, you know, deemed it impacts at their properties, that it's important you, you document some key information, things like the time you're experiencing it, what were the wind directions at the time, if you can, as best as you can, descriptors of the, you know, of the, uh, of the odors. That can be tough because it is subjective sometimes, but, you know, it, it always ask people to do their best to try to put some descriptions behind it. And that allows us to further look into it. Uh, sometimes these complaints come in after hours. Um, we may not uh, get the information until the next day, uh, at that time, we do have air quality analysts in our, uh, our tech support group upstairs, who Stephanie works with closely, that can produce uh, wind rows and pollution rows, and we can start using that to identify if we think there is some maybe potential sources uh, that we should focus our abatement activities at. Uh, that might feed into our inspection programs, so we might use up some of that information to determine, okay, you know, we've had, uh, we see an uptick in complaints around these facilities, so we might focus our inspections uh, in that area. Uh, we could have an ongoing matter at a facility that uh, uh, we could use this back for. So uh, long and short, Melinda, is yes, our goal is to aim, uh, is to respond to every complaint. Um, is that always feasible and possible? No. Uh, I'll be honest, it's, you know, we, we have, uh, I, my office has uh, uh, 14 officers uh, that covers all of Hamilton, Haldeman and Norfolk. Uh, so I have to, you know, adjust our resources and where we can, um, you know, follow up on, on matters. What we do have in Hamilton is a better spread of environmental officers. So we have uh, introduced an additional two environmental officers in the, in the industrial core area um, in, in hopes to better respond and better get out to these type of complaints uh, as quickly as possible. Obviously under the COVID pandemic, things were a bit challenged. Um, you know, things weren't uh, as, uh, you know, we had folks working uh, out of the office. So some of the responses to get in and get uh, get out to the sites, you know, did create some some time gaps, but uh, we're back to, to, to normal operation. And uh, I know that uh, our officers are out daily uh, following up and, and uh, communicating with the public. And if you have any specific sites uh, in particular, want more, uh, um, you know, specifics on Melinda, please don't hesitate to reach out to the office or myself. I'd be happy to, uh, to connect with you. Great. Thank you for that, Stephen. Um, I see Elizabeth has her hand raised, so I'm going to invite her to um, unmute herself and ask her question. Yes. Hi. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, hi. Now, I, I know you're going to be, I think you're going to be talking this evening about the, um, the project, the ongoing yes. Because I had a question about that, you know, and, and the neighborhood I live in and whether we can get, uh, whether we're on the, you know, on the radar to get one of these monitors. And uh, that, that's my question. So I just wanted okay. to 
but it, I should probably save that for later, right? Or, well, that's a perfect yeah. segue because oh, time, okay. time is moving along quickly. So I am going to suggest that we shift over and give Dr. Adams um, the opportunity to give his brief project update. And, and I'm very aware that there are lots more questions and comments in the chat. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll do the update and, and then circle back. And I'm gonna propose, you know, we either, those who are interested can stay on and we can keep going through some additional questions or we could commit to making sure that, um, you know, be, between me and the other speakers that we we generate responses to those remaining questions and we can email them out to all of you after the meeting. But let's shift over to the update because I wanna make sure that people who are here have a chance to, to hear how the project is going. Um, so I am going to share screen again um, and get us over into that. All right, and I'm going to hand it over to, um, once I get the slide up, over to Dr. Adams to provide all of you with the project update. Thank you, Linda. Uh, it's not a long one. I, I figured we would run short on time, but uh, I found that very insightful as a great overview. I know when I was starting to get into this, there were so many acronyms and uh, regulations and rules. It's always tricky to understand what's going on. So about the project, I think it's been moving along quite well. So here is our map of the sampling locations we ended up choosing. Uh, it was really a balance of a few factors, but a major input into selecting these sites was our last uh, information meeting where we heard from the community uh, about concerns. Uh, and then we also need to balance some sites to compare with, um, you know, it, it'd be it's good to identify the hot spots. We also need to get a sense of how air quality changes um, and then maybe areas that aren't necessarily identified as concerns, but maybe of interest. So these are the sites we're looking at. The, uh, we'll call it yellow or orange dots towards the downtown industrial sector. Those are getting measured every month and they're actually right beside some of those Ministry of the Environment or Hammond monitors or Environment Canada monitors that we heard about earlier. And the purpose of this is to allow us to see how close in agreement our measurements are to those ministry dot 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 measurements, which is really important uh, as we take this information to try and make actions out of it. It's just uh, one of our quality control, quality assurance practices. So every dot you'll see on this map, and uh, there's around 60 of them, is, is a sampling location. And we have visited all of them at least once so far this, uh, we'll call it year. It doesn't exactly line up with a calendar year, but a 12 month period. We intend to measure at each one of those three more times uh, before January, 2023. We've been doing pretty well. I'd say we retrieve uh, about 95% of the monitors that we put out, as one could expect, we put these out in the city, um, you know, vandalism is an opportunity, animals can get at them, but for the most part, we're retrieving uh, most of the samples we put out there. And so we don't have any data to share yet, it is a very um, intensive process, getting the sites out, bringing them back in. We do a lot of analysis of, of these samplers in the laboratory. Unlike the data you've heard about from Hammond or the ministry, these are not these real-time measurements. They are a filter uh, that's coated in a chemical that undergoes a chemical reaction when the air pollutant of interest is present. And, and we know the rate that that happens, so we can see how much pollution it captured over that period. But he, I'm really open to questions. And so, you know, why don't we just open the floor for questions about, uh, about anything? I'll talk about that indoor uh, air question that came up. And I'll tell you, as, uh, as a person, you know, just a regular citizen, it's not really, air pollution monitoring is, is not really available to you as an individual. I'll, I'll be very frank. Uh, either the costs are just tremendously too high or the technology doesn't even exist. Uh, there are, uh, and we saw purple air monitors, and those are good for measuring uh, particulate matter. And those are the one tool that is probably really well available to the public. Uh, they're 
not cheap though. I want to say to get one in Canada is around $300. Uh, and it lets you run con continuously. It makes measurements all the time and it plots it on a map. So you could run one of those indoors. If you do, uh, it, you got to be, you're going to see your, when you cook, the indoor measurements of particles really are great predict predictors of when you cook food. Um, and, and that's really what they're going to show you because that signal is going to be really high for those oils on the pans and, and other particles getting formed. Uh, so I don't know, I wouldn't say it's probably a worthwhile investment. We are, you know, personally, as a, as a researcher, I'm hoping we can start doing some indoor measurements of, of air quality across Hamilton as we you know, continue these research questions. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of tools uh, available to the individual. It's, it's just uh, either much too expensive or, or really doesn't even exist in some cases. Thanks for that, Matthew. I did see a, a hand go up, Elizabeth. So if you wanted to maybe unmute yourself and you can ask uh, Dr. Adams your question. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I guess I'm looking at the at the map and trying to figure out if we have a monitor in the Duran neighborhood. <laughs> it's, it, it's kind of small and hard to see. I just, uh, yeah. See. Yes, yeah. that's somewhat intentional. So I'm not sure many of you probably see that this map made its way into the spectator this this oh. past today. Actually, we've been oh, in, in there yeah. today. Yeah. So yeah. we would. I'm just trying to sort myself out. So Duran, yeah, we we should have. Uh, where there's Upper James. So it would be James. Um, yeah down to Maine and um, up to the, yeah, so the escarpment and then over to kind of Queen Street, I think. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So no, it's just because I was just going to kind of let our, our neighborhood association know if we had one. I, I wasn't aware. I, I guess I just I didn't get any notification of, um, of one having been installed. So I was just curious. Yeah, yeah I, I can't, I don't have the map digitally in front of me to pull it up. Uh, let me come back to you there. And I, I do okay, have listen. Here. Um, so um, am I understanding that your, the, your data, you're going to compare it with um, your, your project, your, the data that you collect, you're going to compare it to data being collected by the province? Is, is that... Am I? Yeah, so yeah. so we're gonna we're, yeah. we're collecting at the same locations as the province. Oh, what you'll okay. see yeah. out of this, and then we're collecting at these other locations as well. So we'll have those comparisons. Uh, we we've done that a lot, and our results are are usually spot on. Okay. Uh, so that's very good with the technology. Uh, what we're going to be able to do though is we have really good statistical techniques. So what we do, uh, I'll try and keep this brief, but we look at, at all of the air pollution monitors across Hamilton. And so we have these locations, these very specific locations. And as you can see, we can't cover the entire city, of course. There's neighborhoods, there's areas. But what we do know with air pollution is there is land use patterns that get associated to the emissions. If you live near a major highway, you know, let's say you live at the east end or the west end of the link. That relationship between the distance from your house to the link is going to be pretty similar in what air pollution ends up at your house. So we're going to have some nice air pollution maps that will estimate, it, you know, it's not measured, but it'll estimate really well what air pollution looks like across the entire city as one of the outputs from this. So we'll have, you know, point locations that we measure, but we're going to have interactive maps that you'll be able to, you know, zoom in, go into your neighborhood and see what we believe the air quality looks like if we didn't measure there. And then in those maps, you'll be able to see the specific measurements. You'll get a sense of how it compares. What I hope for from the individuals, uh, you know, as an individual or a community member across Hamilton, is we can sort of see across the city which air monitor maybe best represents you. Is it the Hamilton downtown monitor? Is it a, do you tend to have the same concentrations in your area as, you know, maybe you're near the industrial monitors? So we'll have a sense and be able to do some analysis of what areas 
uh, are best represented by each of the air monitors that continuously operates those you know, Ministry of the Environment uh, Conservation and Parks monitors, for example. So we'll you know, be doing a lot of analysis to look across space of how air quality changes for the city, what are areas of concern, uh, and then what are areas that are similar, dissimilar, for example. The, um, all the dots on the map, are, are, are they all your monitors? No, some, some of them must be. Every, every dot here we are putting monitors up at, yes. Oh, wow, okay. Yes, so it's, it's very comprehensive. It covers all of the different types of land use across the city as best we could. So we have areas with um, you know, lots of transportation infrastructure or minimal transportation infrastructure monitors upwind of the industrial core, downwind of the industrial core, as you can see along the beach strip. Uh, we have rural sites, you know, all the way up to Freelton, Carlisle. We really want to get a sense of what does air quality look like across Hamilton as a whole. But you can see we've really focused in, in a lot of this downtown core because we do know there's um, a lot of residents in this area. And, you know, a lot of those areas have suggested concerns uh, definitely from the community that we wanted to investigate. Sure. Now, is the province on, uh, on board with all that with this? I mean, I, I, I see that, uh, yeah, so the Ministry uh, of Environment, Conservation Parks is on board with this? They're... Uh, yeah, they're not, they're not a project partner per se, but they've been absolutely at the table in the conversations. We've been talking about what we've been doing, communicating. Uh, we will communicate our findings. They are very much aware of the project. Um, I'm not sure how much they can comment about it, but they are definitely participating. And that's been great to see. And they've been very helpful, actually giving us some information about potential hotspots and, and other areas that we might want to focus our measurements on. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I see there's a hand raised, but I can't see who it is. And yeah, I I'm having the same issue. That's all. That means you're fine. So if you have your hand here. raised, uh, just just go ahead and start talking. Uh, yeah. I see Adan. Oh, it looks like oh, yes. Adan, yes, Amaya. hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you uh, doc, both to Dr. Lucas again, to uh, all the speakers for this incredible uh, presentation meeting. Um, it was really insightful as a Hamiltonian, um, like knowing about the legislation and the processes that go behind uh, air quality measurements and regulations uh, and sort of uh, seeing if certain industries or companies or projects meet up to those. Um, I guess I had a couple questions, if that's okay. Um, first to uh, Dr. Adams, I, I want to know, I want to know specifically the approach you use to estimate the sort of the air quality measurements between the clusters from, like you said, how you have those point uh, measurements from the actual monitors, and but you also can't logistically put a monitor on every single corner, every single street. I, I was just curious, like, do you like uh, if you use a certain type of software, a certain type of like algorithm or uh, differential yeah, equations? No, absolutely. So it's actually um, some statistical approaches that we've been adopting and, and developed in ourselves, but to very broadly describe it, we look at all of our measurement locations and then we take uh, buffers, we draw circles around them in computer mapping software, and then we extract land use information. So we'll look at how much major highway is within that one kilometer buffer, how much industrial land, how much fill in the blank what's the population density we have about 250 criteria that we measure when we use that in a statistical model to try to take those land use factors to explain the variations that we see between our measurements so we try to figure out in a statistical model what are the factors that cause the differences in our observed air pollution measurements once we establish that relationship we can then just calculate for any location of interest, the parameters that were important. So say we wanted to measure somewhere that we hadn't monitored, we would calculate all those same measurements, put it into our statistical model, and we would get a concentration output from it. And so that's what we do. And, and we use a lot of 
fancy machine learning techniques to achieve it, but we've been very successful. Uh, I'll, I wish I don't have anything to share, but you know, let me pull up a slide and then I'll give you a sense of the scale at which these can actually occur. You can see um, as small as intersections, actually, we've done in Mississauga. I just have to pull up a slide. So um, maybe ask your other question, we'll come back to it. Yeah, um, uh, one question that has been uh, a very to a topic of interest of mine is sort of um, similar to what was addressed in the Hamilton Code Red or the Specs Code Red report about, um, like it was a very brief mention of uh, air quality measurements uh, sort of aligning with social determinants of health, um, particularly, you know, if areas uh, like a certain um, area in downtown Hamilton that is sort of uh, seen as like low income and more marginalized having worse air quality measurements um, versus the escarpment. I was just wondering to all the professionals in this call if, uh, you know, have you noticed, like, have you yourself ever uh, sort of noticed a trend in that situation? Has that aligned with, you know, if, do you see if uh, like air quality measurements sort of align with certain social determinants of health? And if so, is there a specific one that stands out if it's like low income or if it's an indigenous identity, racialized communities? I know that one's also like a very loaded question. It's more of just an interest in like the Hamilton context. I'll take this one because I think I can speak probably most freely about it. Uh, this is something we honestly don't have that much information in the Canadian context. We we know it exists in the US and that's where most of the studies have taken place. Uh, Michael Jarrett, who used to be a professor at McMaster, did identify this concern, but that would be uh, data that would be in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, what you're talking about uh, is actually part of this project as well. So we ensured that we stratified our measurements across uh, the Ontario Marginalization Index, which takes in a whole number of these potential factors uh, into four measures. And we will use those, use our data, and then we're going to compare what air quality looks like at probably dissemination area by dissemination area with all of these sort of factors that you, you mentioned, um, you know, income, you know, immigration status. It, we are doing this work in Toronto and Mississauga as well. It's one of the major components of our research group's application of these projects. And it's something that we thought about in the design of this monitoring network to ensure we'd actually be able to capture those relationships if they exist. So we have measurements in high income, medium and low income, for example. Often that's not thought about and it's it's done after the fact, but we will, if those relationships exist, we should capture them in this data. Hamilton is interesting with this gentrification that has taken place in a lot of the areas that would have often been higher air pollution in the past and has displaced a lot of low income people that might offset a bit of that in recent years. Um, but it is something that we would expect and, and have seen in our studies in other regions of the GTHA. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Adan. Does anyone else have any burning questions for Dr. Adams? Um, and um, if not, um, I think we're just going to finish with that. We just want to share some next steps with you briefly too. And I'm just, I'm just very aware of time. So we want to be respectful of everyone's time tonight. So I'm just going to quickly um, cover the next couple of slides. It's just very brief next steps. So I just got to get this to advance. So we want to make sure that you're all aware that um, this project um, has two more community meetings that are coming. So we do have a meeting planned for the fall of this year. It's probably going to be in October. We don't have an exact date set yet, but we want to make sure you're aware of it because the conversations that we're starting here with Dr. Adams in terms of the data and, and how it's all been, how the data collection, the monitoring has been structured is going to be, we'll continue a lot of those conversations. At that meeting, there will be a presentation by Dr. Adams and his team of some preliminary results, because by that point, we know that they will have data. 
Uh, and we want to engage all of you in a community conversation about um, data presentation and use. Um, so um, the, the team will be looking to community to help with input around, you know, what, what would be a good way to present the data so that it's understandable for community and useful for community when it's shared back um, to, to the broader public in, in Hamilton. And then, of course, I mean, to me, this is the really exciting question is how, how can the, the information be used, you know, once we get more fulsome results, um, how might that change um, what's happening on the ground in our community. And, and so we certainly want all of you to be part of that conversation. So I'm, again, I'm going to say to, to everyone that you've registered for this webinar. So that means you, you are on the email list and we'll be sending up a follow up, sending through a follow up email um, that will include uh, details about the fall meeting and how you can sign on to the project update list so that you'll, you'll receive the details um, of that meeting and you can you can register for it but but we'll also share project updates um, so watch for that email from us and i do also just want to thank everyone our, our speakers tonight really appreciate everyone putting together those presentations and sharing them with all of us and thank you to uh, the project team and dr adams in particular tonight for sharing his update uh, about the project i'm just going to very quickly stop sharing again um, and just, just to say to all of you, I know that there have been, a, a, there's a whole long list of additional comments and questions in the chat, um, but, but we are already at, it's almost quarter to nine. So I'm going to suggest, and, and I hope this is good with all of you, I am going to commit to downloading that, that list of comments and questions, and we will make sure that we work through all of those comments and questions that um, weren't, uh, weren't addressed tonight, and we, we will follow up. And, and the way we'll do it, is we'll send an email out uh, to the whole list of people who were registered tonight so that everyone who's here um, will have a chance to hear what the additional questions or comments were, questions that were asked by attendees, uh, and we'll include responses from, from our speakers and from the project team so that you'll, you'll have that information as a follow-up to tonight, because we do appreciate everybody taking the time to share your questions and concerns. Um, and I'm just seeing that Dr. Adams has put a comment in here that he's got example maps that he's willing to share um, at, at the end. Uh, so maybe we'll invite anyone who wants to stay on and, and have a look at those maps, please feel free to do so. But, but for anyone who feels that they, they need to sign off and um, go and relax for the rest of the night or whatever you need to do now, please you know, feel free to go ahead and do that as well. Um, so thanks to everyone. and. Um, we hope that we'll see you turn up in our fall meeting for the ongoing conversation. And I was gonna to add to stay tuned. We've got some great little uh, videos that Environment Hamilton has been pulling together, including, I, I know there's a really great one um, with Alicia, um, the master's student working with Dr. Adams. And she talks in more detail about the, the passive air monitors that they're using and how they work. So we're gonna share more of that as well with you. So you, you get a deeper understanding of um, how, how the project works. So thank you everyone. And maybe I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Adams if you wanna get those maps up and, and share some more information for people who wanna stick around and, and learn some more. Great, thanks. Thanks, Linda. I'm happy to take questions for about 10, 12 more minutes and then I have to go play some ultimate Frisbee. Um, <laughs> keep my sanity. Um, but I will share some maps. These are from Hamilton, uh, from Mississauga, from work we've done in the past, but they'll give a sense of the scale at which we can uh, estimate air quality for. So here, and if I don't know if you're familiar, on the right, we have Mississauga. These maps are blown up, so they've lost a little bit of their resolution. So that's all of Mississauga. You can see the major highways uh, to the north there. That's Pearson Airport, which is going to have a fairly large signal for the pollutant we're measuring. You can see peaks of, this is nitrogen dioxide in both of these, so a transportation related air pollutant. You can see how around all our major highways, major roadways, there's those peaks. Uh, here, when you zoom right in, here's the Here Ontario Highway 10 corridor running through Peel. And you can see those sort of hot spots at highway interchanges, for example. Uh, sometimes they're upwind, sometimes they're downwind, just depending on what makes sense there. But this is the sort of level or granularity that you can expect from the air pollution maps that we will be producing 
for Hamilton. So it really does let you get a sense of what local air quality should look like. So I just wanted to make sure those were brought up, but I, I am willing to answer any other questions if people have them. I'm going to stop sharing just because I can't see what's going on uh, Zoom otherwise. Yeah, I see Elizabeth's hand up. Elizabeth, is that a new hand or is that from before? If it's new, feel free to unmute. Me. It's an old hand, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, let me uh, get rid of it. I don't know how to do that. But... Um, yeah, I actually, it, oh. I, I have a question and, and sorry, Matthew, it's not specifically about the maps, although the visualizations look amazing. I think that's the sort of just the the different colors and, and helping people to understand um, varying levels of air pollution based on the colors, I think is a really effective um, way to communicate. But I'm but one of the things that I want, wonder whether between uh, provincial ministry people and um, and uh, Patrick, uh, you know, from the federal perspective, if if between between you, you could help people to understand, because I'm going to fess up and say I was confused by this at first, but that sort of transition from the federal level when we talk about cakes and other standards, the transition down to the provincial level, could somebody speak a little bit to how that works? And I know, you know, in the past, we even had conversations at the federal level about industry, industries and industry emission levels and talking about standards there, but then realizing that a stand, I, I guess my point is setting a standard and enforcing a standard or a regulation are two very different things. I can speak to the setting of the standards. I mean, this is, this goes through, um, uh, I mean, like the, I said, that the federal is, is that, like I presented earlier, comes up with the, the initial range numbers of what, what could be a standard. But then there's multiple uh, consultation and meetings and discussions on, and it, it has to be a, a consensus. And eventually it, it's one number that everybody agrees on. But, um, I mean, these centers, they, they are, they're initially from uh, the, the federal because uh, we, we have the, all the data with the, the health effects and environmental uh, modeling and all that. So this is how we come up with a range. And eventually there's discussion, there's uh, negotiations, and currently it's happening for uh, PM 2.5. So for, for fine part that matters, it's, um, it's been going for, on for... Um, I'd say about uh, six months and have um, about two or three months going to have the, 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 the standard, uh, the, the cake set. So this, I don't know if that answers your question. It's a little bit how the internal procedure goes. But in terms of the application, it, this is not something uh, uh, we deal with. Yeah, thank There's you for monitoring. that. So then ultimately the, the actual implementation of whatever standard is set becomes the responsibility of the province. Yes, yes, Yeah. absolutely. Hi, Linda. Hi, it's Natalie Stacey Hi, from Natalie. the ministry. Hi, I thought I would just add to that. Um, yes. Sure. Um, yeah, just for clarity, the CAKES, as Health Canada have indicated, um, they are targets for continuous improvement. And as discussed during the presentation, they are updated every five years and are gradually lowered um, and ratcheted down and become more stringent for continuous improvement. And those levels are what determine um, what action level different areas fall into. And then the different provinces, depending on how they've defined um, their air sheds or their air zone management framework, they take those um, air sheds that have been defined according to those action levels. And that can inform um, the development of different policies at the higher level, but at the local level, it is the local air quality regulation that's enforceable um, with the regulated standards and as well as other guidelines that are in place. Um, so that's more of the local information that's used 
um, to regulate emissions um, uh, from specific facilities. Great, thank you for that, Natalie. That's, yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah, I don't know at this point, are there, are there any other comments or questions or? I was gonna just offer up, Linda, sure. that there were a few more questions, you know, in the chat that we can, mm -hmm. we can get to if people want to kind of move through them. And, and I know some of these questions are fresh in their minds and I think there's a few I can speak to still. Uh, you know, I think with, uh, I think the last one I answered was Melinda's. Uh, and I hope I provided enough information on that. I know there's some some questions on you know what happens after a call. I think I was trying to get to the to that to the details of we sometimes use that for our uh, inspection programming. Um, sometimes if we have an incident, we'll follow up directly and start uh, requiring actions from a facility. Um, and I hope that the officers are following up. Uh, we have been you know you know I think it's important from from our standpoint as environmental officers that we do follow up with the community. We we have all, obviously lots on the go, but it's important that we do follow up with some of our findings. And sometimes as as, as OD can be transient um, that becomes difficult it's, it's not always uh, a steady flow of odors coming from a site and sometimes it's transit tracking that down can become a challenge but uh, you know I think we look to the community as our eyes and ears uh, they're out there all the time and, uh, and so we try to make sure we create that rapport uh, there was a bit of a follow-up question I know uh, you had uh, asked about why uh, ham -N does not provide API you know, Johan, I don't think I'm the best to answer that. I'm not sure if Natalie, uh, you wanted to touch base on that. Sure, I, sure. I can speak to that uh, very broadly. So the API, as well as the AQI, those indices on the Purple Air website are US EPA based indices. So they don't necessarily line up um, with the index for air quality that we use here in Ontario, which is the air quality health index. So that's the reason that we don't um, have our information displayed um, on those other public maps. I agree, it's great for public information and it makes the information really easy, uh, really easy to understand and it's accessible, but those are US EPA based indices. Um, so Unfortunately, or fortunately, we have um, separate websites reporting um, the air quality health index, which we use in Ontario. Um, and that can be found at airqualityontario.com for the provincial AQHI monitoring network. And as you've already mentioned, um, the Hammond Air uh, monitoring network, they have their own website, uh, hammondair.ca. Um, just as a general aside, we do work very closely with Hammond. Um, and one of, um, one of the topics that we've been discussing with them recently um, is um, how to make their website more understandable and the information more e easily digested by the public. Um, so again, if there are any comments or questions along those lines, there is an email address where you can submit feedback on the Hammond website. You can also reach out to the ministry as well. Um, but we work very closely with Hammond um, they do follow all of our ministry guidelines that we provide for air quality monitoring. Um, we constantly audit their stations. We have a lot of oversight over their monitoring and their data um, that's reported. And uh, we're in very close communication. So one of, like I said, one of um, the areas um, that we're looking at is how to make the information a little bit more accessible to the general public. Um, so if there is any feedback, feel free to submit it either to Hammond or to the ministry. And uh, we always, we're always looking for um, continuous uh, ways that we can improve how this information is reported. So we gladly receive any feedback. Thank you. That's great, Natalie. Thank you for that. And, and I'm, I keep jotting down things I'm going to add to this email that's going out to everyone, but I'll be sure to share the link to the Hammond, the Hamilton Air Monitoring Network, the, the the network of, of monitors in and around the industrial core to, to community members so that if you haven't been to that site before, it, it is sometimes challenging to navigate, but there is, once you get the hang of it, there is lots of useful information there. So we'll share that. Um, okay, um, I'm just gonna add here and, and um, there's a there was a comment from Krista about, um, and, and she referenced Melinda's question around the smelly days. And she wondered, do smelly days equate to higher emissions, and if this is something um, that uh, us as residents should be concerned about, and I think 
I think it's fair to say, can I say this? All of us as Hamiltonians know what um, Krista is talking about, you know, those days where it's like, whoa, mm -hmm. J just depending on how the wind is blowing, you notice, you notice that industry yeah. smell, you know, it might vary from one part of the city, but sometimes it's just heavy everywhere. So I wonder if someone maybe from the ministry or, you yeah. know, public health think, wants to comment. Well, maybe I can just start off a bit from the ministry. I know maybe Natalie sure. can pipe in or maybe uh, Matt has some, some additional stuff to add, but I think, you know, do smelly days equate to higher emissions? I don't know if I could say they equate to higher emissions. I think as, as Linda, you know, described under certain meteorological conditions, uh, some of those days and we get these sort of uh, poor, uh, you know, see the poor air quality days or these inversion days that we run into, we sometimes get into these conditions that, um, you know, can, can really prevent that sort of, uh, I guess, the ability for stuff to to get away. It's sort of locked into that lower city and it can get quite stinky. I don't necessarily know what we could say it equates to higher emissions. Uh, but of course, if it's something that, you know, when we're detecting these type orders that we, we find for the ministry, we can get that information, find out what you're smelling, try to get the descriptors. It does become challenging on those days when the winds are coming in off the lake. Uh, when we see those conditions and we have those inversion conditions and we're not getting that dispersion being allowed to occur, uh, it can get, uh, it can get, uh, you know, challenging. Uh, we do have at the ministry local port quality notifications that we have uh, rolled out. Um, it's been something in place for a while. We've revitalized it a bit to be more reflective of the day and age. Um, and, you know, we will ask companies to implement actions to try to uh, improve their uh, input, um, you know, where they can. So, um, you know, it's tough, but I don't know, Matt, if you want to, from a, from a health standpoint, your, your take. Um, well, from a health standpoint, I know that it's hard to quantify odor. Uh, olfactorometric metric analysis, uh, it's something that we don't, you know, at the, the local public health department, we're not definitely experts in or anything. We would still need to... Um, partner with MECP and our Health Canada colleagues on any, you know, of the information that's known about that uh, type of correlation between what is smelled and how you quantify it to relate to other things that you can quantify in air measuring. So it's, um, unfortunately, I have nothing to add other than to say that, um, you know, some, some examples I think of recent kind of um, uh, smell-based investigations had to do with uh, a hydrogen sulfide uh, leak a little while ago. Like when I say a little while ago, because of this pandemic, I'm sorry, this could have been 18 months now at this point in Stony Creek, and it had kind of the the rotten egg sulfur smell um, that comes out, and uh, there was a lot of it happening in the east end uh, of Stony Creek. But um, you know when when it's a it's an odor that you recognize, but when I believe that there was any uh, analysis around this, nothing showed up at a level of hydrogen sulfide that would be threatening to life or health. So it's, you know, we smell it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it could injure you. But then again, when you get back into the uh, the evolutionary model, why these things exist, it's it's that you can sense these things because your body's trying to say, hey, you're being exposed to a chemical here, whether it's a, a good one from the smell of something cooking on a barbecue to a bad one, which is, ooh, I want to go away from that versus closer to it. Um, if I can add something to what Matt is mm. saying, uh, I, I agree with you um, and uh, but one, one thing we, we do know is uh, definitely the, the biggest health burden uh, in Canada is uh, for fine particulate matter. And this is not related to smell at all. So like whether this smell, I mean, it, like you said, it would have to know what, what we are smelling exactly uh, in these days. Uh, but I, the main concern normally is more uh, for, for fine particulate matter. But one, one thing we, we are planning to do to, uh, at Health Canada is to um, develop what's called a health-based um, air quality objective. So that should be coming in uh, probably in about a, a year maximum. We start to develop these uh, objectives with a, a level that uh, should be protective of health. And some of them uh, include, um, let's say, smelly compounds like uh, VOCs and PAH. Or, um, so that, that could help uh, cover and to help to guide uh, 
uh, residents if they have complaints and maybe they could be uh, some help from the provincial or um, uh, that way that, that they could monitor at least identify these and, and have a, a number that we know is uh, health related. Hopefully that, that helps. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I'm just looking at the next um, comment question on the list and this is from Shelly and I, I did notice in an, an further down on the list, there was a similar concern raised by Christine. And she says, I live in a part of Hamilton, not well known for poor air quality, but we live about one block from the highway and can smell the fumes during rush hour. Are there monitors set up in Ancaster? And I know Christine raised a similar concern as she's on the South Mountain near a road that's busy with trucks and, and expressed concern about being able to smell diesel fumes. So I wonder if, if anyone could speak to that and maybe for both Shelly and Christine, it would be helpful if you could share advice on you know, what they can do. Is there anything that they can do if, if they're concerned about this and you know, the fact that they're smelling it says to me that we are, you know, that, that there are points in the day or maybe it's consistent where the emissions are a problem. Um, I'll talk, yeah, we are making measurements near all of the major transportation routes in, in Hamilton for what you can do. Uh, unfortunately, is probably go inside, shut your doors. And uh, if you have some sort of HEPA air filter, turn it on. Uh, you know, maybe ch don't choose those times to be outside as, as bad as that sounds. Um, you know, it's a fairly large scale process that's occurring to uh, cause those. But if you are smelling, and it's very reasonable, we kind of estimate around five, 300 to 500 meters within uh, a major highway is sort of a major area of concern usually. So, uh, and if you're smelling diesel fumes, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty reasonable to expect where those are coming from. Did anyone else want to add anything to that one? I just have a, a, a quick piece of advice and, and Linda, you'll, you'll know this. Um, this is one of the first things that uh, I remember uh, when I started participating in coordinating Cleaner Hamilton was Dr. Dennis Core, not necessarily for uh, being a bystander or, or close to the highway, but uh, being in the highway or on the highway uh, from his perspective is one of the worst uh, areas uh, to be in terms of exposure to air pollution. And while you're in your vehicles, turn your, um, your fan to recirculate so you're, you're recirculating the air and not taking in especially when you're in gridlock traffic so just a bit bit of a piece of advice um uh un, unscientifically founded i think um uh, but uh i would trust dr dr core uh, with giving sound air quality exposure advice to that um and then also just through some research uh that uh, i've seen on buffering uh, planting trees, vegetation, um, trees have uh, very good uh, filtering ability of air pollution, which is why through Cleaner Hamilton and public health, uh, we fund multiple uh, tree planting activities, um, including tree act activity plantings that uh, Environment Hamilton does, as well as Green Venture. Uh, so just a, a couple pieces of advice there. Yeah, and, and I would just add, it feels like we need to have more and serious conversations about enhanced public transportation and maybe the electrification of that system, whether it's local or um, you know systems like the GO system, so that people are 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 not. I, I just think about commuters who are stuck on the highway and Dennis Core describing that you know that the exposure you get there is being so problematic if you're if you're stuck in congested traffic. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, shifts in these other directions, hopefully, I guess, I guess it's not, it's, it's, it's not helpful for people, um, people who have raised concerns about being able to smell the emissions from their homes, but, but I, it feels like in time, we need to really deal with this issue moving forward. Electrification, just, hopefully, will get us there. Thanks, Linda. I'll just add a little bit about transportation. Um, and we don't have any air monitors currently in those two locations um, where the questions came from regarding um, odors or air quality from roadways. But our branch in Toronto does have um, some roadside stations set up where we have been investigating um, traffic related air pollutants. 
there are um, at least three or four. And we have um, considered something similar in Hamilton, although um, it would most likely be located um, closer to um, one of the major highways, um, either the 403 or Burlington Street or Nikola Tesla, which were suggested um, some time ago. Um, but if that it ever did come off the ground, that's something that we would um, potentially look at uh, locally in Hamilton. And if there are concerns, again, about specific areas and the question from Dundas referenced um, some odors in the air from specific wind directions. Again, if um, they'd like to feel free to pass that information along to the ministry, um, we can look further into that in terms of whether that could potentially be transportation related or potentially something else in the area, um, some unknown um, source. Um, but yeah, that's something that we would definitely I'd be happy to look into if that information was passed along. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Natalie. And I see that Kathy Renwald is still here because she posted another question. So I'm going to make sure that we ask Kathy's questions since she's here, she can listen to the responses. So she asks, um, uh, earlier on, she asked, does the sandblasting of building exteriors come under any bylaw that requires mitigation procedures? I see this a lot in Hamilton, lots of airborne particulate. So Kathy, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh... I could take a kick, I guess, from the provincial standpoint. Uh, you know, we have Regulation 419, which does speak to construction and sandblasting activities, uh, and companies are required to take all uh, measures necessary to control it to the site. Uh, as you can imagine, some of these uh, new builds and construction areas, uh, that becomes extremely difficult. Um, and, you know, we sort of, in a sense, look to partner with the, with the municipalities on this. Uh, you know, municipalities issue the building permits. Uh, you know, they put some requirements set on them. And then the province has the, the outstanding legislation of Forward 9, Section 40, I believe 49, and uh, Regulation 419 that we could utilize. So um, I'm just going to pull back that question there again. Kathy's like, or Andrea, sorry. Uh, I know Andrea McDowell sent. Uh, the web resource for the dust and particulate matter uh, as oh, well good. to her. Yep. So I know that, uh, that that would uh, help answer some of those questions. Uh, so yeah, it, it does kick off a lot of particulate we've run into with the, you know, a big one in Hamilton too, is you see a lot of these new buildings going with the stucco finishes. Uh, and so they get that, um, you know, the rasping that they do and send that uh, the styrofoam out and, and we've responded to, uh, to to multiple complaints in Hamilton over the years uh, dealing with that. We have steps that we take. I know we have officers that sit on the uh, dust committee uh, with the city of Hamilton and work to ensure that information is, is shared over with that group on, on some uh, some best actions or best practices uh, these companies can follow. And, and when we respond to these, we, we really encourage that. Sometimes that's shutting down the, the business to like tarp it properly until they get things in place. Uh, sometimes has remedial requirements to clean up the roadways, uh, especially if we get the styrofoam, because we know if it runs down, it ends up in a storm sewer, it ends up out in the, uh, the harbor, which is uh, not a good thing either. So, uh, so yeah, there's, uh, bylaw has some particular uh, requirements in their building codes. I can't speak directly to them, but I do know this new dust um, this dust group uh, that, that involves levels of, of both municipal and provincial government um, has been very successful in creating a bit of a framework or a, I guess a workbook in a sense to send out to, to contractors, constructors, uh, even just regular homeowners uh, to be aware of, of some of their activities, cutting concrete. Um, you know, you see many people go and they just start cutting concrete with no water and uh, can create some significant dust. So um, try to encourage and ensure people are taking the, uh, the best practices to minimize it. We know construction has to happen. We know these things occur, uh, but there are actions and, and steps people can take to really minimize their, uh, you know, their, their impacts. And, and I would add, um, you know, we always advise people when they see those kinds of problems to call it in to the ministry. Yep. Ministry yep. will respond because it's an offsite impact, as you say, Stephen. It's particulate yep. pollution, and or you know, we've I issued the styrofoam would be yep. plastic pollution. It's stuff we don't want to get out there. For, for sure, no. And I think yeah. you know, and I think sometimes that's education, and sometimes just explaining to contractors when they see this stuff and they kind of look, well, it's just styrofoam, and, and it's like, yeah, I know it is, but that styrofoam ends up accumulating along the curb, and then the rainfall comes, and that goes into that storm sewer. And I don't think you know, it's still funny. I mean, maybe because I've been in the business long enough that. You, People don't realize that those drain into a nearby water course. And so whatever drops there ends up in those areas. So sometimes just that education outreach really does, uh, 
you know, does a great, uh, you know, has has a great results. And I think that's where this this dust group out of the, the city that's uh, that Andrew has been leading has, has done an outstanding job on, on getting that information out there. Yeah, for sure. And the concrete cutting, I would add to, you know, something people don't realize and, and you know, at Environment Hamilton, we'll do gentle interventions where we talk to, <laughs> we talk to construction workers and help them ask whether they're aware, because often they're not wearing any protection. And, and for community members, so you're aware when you cut concrete, you generate fine silica dust, mm -hmm. um, and it can over time contribute to silicosis. So it's like, it's like microscopic shards of glass that can get far down into your lungs, and your, your lungs react by creating scar tissue and, and chronic exposure. Can, can I mean you imagine a construction worker a lifetime of working unprotected it can kill them yeah. um, so it's and, serious and um, I always and make done a point of describing it that way very graphically shards of glass yeah <laughs> and we've done referrals but... we've done referrals to the labor group as well on that yeah. that if you're seeing a contractor out there and, and uh, you know, he's, you know, he or she's cutting concrete and, and no, no mass, no controls, no water. Um, yeah. You know, we have, uh, we have it, uh, involved labor where we felt it warranted for the, for the circumstances. But, you know, I said, I think generally, like you say, Linda, some of that soft intervention of just education outreach with them, making them aware uh, that, you know, this is some of the impacts not only to your own health, but that to the environmental aspect sometimes has, has great results. Yeah. Now, I, I am now going to say to all of you, it's 10 after nine. <laughs> so I think I am going to wrap, wrap it up. And, if I, and I, I know there are keen folks left, but, but I'm, I'm just also mindful that, um, you know, some of our guests here from particularly, you know, our, our government guests, have not, not that the rest of you haven't, I know we've probably all put in a long day of work. Um, so, so I'm going to wrap it up, but I just want to say thank you to everyone. I think you know, I, I, this is an issue that so many Hamiltonians are concerned about and people from outside. I know we, we had some, some friends join us from Sault Ste. Marie, which is wonderful. Um, so thanks everyone for, for joining us here today. Thank you to all of our, our guest speakers and other uh, government agency folks, Stephen and um, Natalie and others who were here and willing to jump in and, and share your knowledge and expertise as well. I think, I know we uh, collectively, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of everyone in community by saying we we appreciate you taking the time to answer the questions and and i and i am seriously gonna gonna work through the rest of those questions and um we'll make sure they all get answered but thanks again folks and we hope you all have a have a great night um and um we we hope to see all of you soon so take care everyone thanks, thanks everybody stay safe take care thanks have a good night thanks right steven thanks good night Thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Andrea. Good night, everyone.